You know, coming to Wichita State University is coming home. And in 1987, 30 years ago, I walked across a graduation stage, a ceremony. You know, it's an actually, it's an awkward walk. You've got this goofy gown on. You've got a silly hat. I can say this, I'm an educator. And you're trying to figure out how to use your hands so that you can accept your diploma and shake hands at the same time. And actually, that handshake is kind of weird because it pulls you along, if you know what I mean. <laughs> it's like a tug into the future. This is going to happen in a couple weeks again, this special occasion, right? And, and those graduates are going to become change agents wherever they are. They're going to become change agents in their workplaces. They're going to be change agents in their communities, in the state, in the nation, wherever they are in the globe. And they can only do this with the help and preparation of the faculty and staff, with the love and support, perhaps, of a family, with uh, their own initiative and their hard work ethic, and just good luck, and maybe the grace of God. How else could a long-haired, wait, just use your imagination. <laughs> How else could a long-haired kid from the east side actually ever become a change agent? Well, I think the room is full of them. Let me explain a little bit more. I think there's a lesson. My path has been engineering. There's a lesson I can share that should be true for every vocation, for every discipline. It's this. Catch this. The most prolific change agents in the modern world are those that can think deeply about the relationship of value and design. It's a long sentence, so let it soak in. Value and design. Actually, let's do an exercise to help. So we're going to do an exercise that uh, we'll borrow from social media. Actually, so we had the thumbs before social media had them. So, <laughs> but we're going to do an exercise where I will show you six pictures, and I'm going to ask you to make a snap judgment. So you'll make a snap judgment on, is this valuable or not valuable? And then we'll take the same picture, and I'll ask you, what about the design? Good, bad. Hopefully this illuminates, kind of cheeky, I know. Hopefully this illuminates uh, something about the relationship between value and design. This is our first subject. All right, so get your analog voting machines ready. And decide, what about value? Thumbs up or thumbs down, extend it, make it happen. Now, look at your neighbor. This is the point of social media, isn't it? <laughs> okay, so I'm looking for thumbs up, thumbs down, I see a mix. Let's talk about the design, okay? All right. I love to see the mix. So, did anybody think about LED lighting? Well, how does LED affect value? Does it affect the design? Let's take the next example. The wonderful old pencil sharpener. Okay, let's get ready. Get your voting machine's value. Oh, wonderful mix. I see, it looks like a lot of people are still using pencils. There's a lot of pencil sharpening go going on here. What about design, those planetary gears, that, that spiral cutting? Okay, a lot of thumbs up I still see. It's a bunch of millennials in the house that just <laughs> hipsters that love this stuff. <laughs> Let's take the next one. How about a mini? What do you think about value? Let's see it. Oh, it's wonderful to see the mix. What about design? All right. Those of you who still have your thumbs up do not carry much luggage. <laughs> this one's a little bit harder. This is the Golden Gate Bridge in San Francisco. In today's dollars, the cost is $1.5 billion. It's a little bit harder. What do you think about value? Make a snap judgment. How complicated is the value proposition for something like this? Very complicated. How about design? What do you think of? Okay, pretty unanimous. 
All right, now I want to show you one more where value and cost may differ. Hopefully that example kind of pointed that out. Here's another one where value and cost differ. What about that blood glucose meter? All right, let's see it. Value, it looks pretty unanimous. What about design, just based on what you see? Mobile, okay. You ready for the punchline now? Here's the punchline. Let's take your degree. Maybe you are pursuing a degree. Maybe you have thoughts of a degree. Let's take that degree and I want you to assess value. This is a darkened room. I know we're at a university, but you can vote however you want. Nobody's going to see you. I will see you. Okay, it's a mix. What about the design of that program of study? And, oh my, <laughs> I will not report out the results here. Well, this was the dilemma of a student. I came out of my faculty office. I found Ben sitting on the floor. He's, let me give you a description. Ben's got a flannel shirt covered with a canvas jacket. He's got a, I got to unbutton to show you this. He's got a stocking cap on his head that is huge. The picture does not do it justice. It's absolutely huge, just like your grandmother's shawl atop his head. And he looks up and offers an explanation. My girlfriend knitted it for me. Okay, I get it. You wear it, right? And, but he goes on and says, Dr. Melton, I am disillusioned with engineering. I am discouraged by my education. Wow, those are heavy words. So I wanted to investigate this, but let me tell you a little bit more about Ben. I met Ben early on in his academic career because I asked him, I saw him as a student, I asked him, why do you bicycle in the snow? Ben bicycled to and from his grandmother's house probably about 12 miles because it was the same route I took. Uh, about 12 miles, I knew that. And, and so he would bicycle back and forth. Why? To reduce his carbon footprint. Okay, a little insight into Ben, right? So, he's discouraged. He decides to take a year off. So his coming back to my office was after a year hiatus. He's been gone. He actually went out to California, I find out, bicycled around 400 miles. No, maybe it's 4,000 miles. It's a huge number of miles, just trust me. <laughs> and I've always believed Ben. And so he's, he's biked all over the place. And while he's been doing that, I have the privilege of going through a workshop that a foundation was putting on at my university. In fact, a whole set of colleagues were going through a workshop. We were discussing not the technical part, but how students think, the mindset piece. Let me explain a little bit further. There is the you piece, and so the you piece is like your identity, your beliefs, your values, and then if you look on the screen on the other side, there is the skill set stuff that you apply, you do things in the world, but there's something in between. That in-between piece is mindset. It, it determines how you react to situations. For example, say there's a challenge or a failure or you see an opportunity. Your mindset helps determine that. If you don't like the word mindset, let me share three other words that are about equivalent. Dispositions, attitudes, and motivations. Pack those all up and you've got mindset. Okay? You get the idea? So, you have to have mindset and skill set working together. It's kind of like having a tandem bike. Or maybe it's kind of like saying skill set is the power, mindset is, provides the direction. Okay. If you're not hanging with me yet, I want to give you a couple more examples. Let's say there's a surgeon. And the surgeon, you want to have great skills. And they do. They have wonderful skills, valuable skills. But how much more powerful are they if they have a mindset that is the care for the human condition. You see, that's not a skill, care for the human condition. They will maximize their skills. If they're curious about new technologies, that's gonna be great. Curiosity, that's not quite a skill, is it? Okay. So, take a second example, a police officer. They are trained in the use of weapons. 
They know how to drive. They can communicate authoritatively. That's all the training. Don't you want them to have a mindset that is around civic safety and rule of law? You see what I mean? That's a mindset, not a skill. Let's take the punchline again. What about an engineer? Now, I'm talking to everybody in here, but let's take the case of engineering because that happens to be my background. What, as an educator, what do you want the mindset to be? The engineers are responsible for a lot of things that we call the stuff of human flourishing. They create things, they take resources and figure out how to scale it so it makes everything better, easier, faster, cheaper. So what do you want an engineer's mindset to be? It, it's behind me, actually. It's, it's about curiosity. You want them to be curious about what's coming next. You want them to connect information together. You want them to think about value and create and deliver value. In fact, those three things are the three C's. That's what I've been working with a number of colleges, and we have picked up those three C's, the theme of this conference. This is the definition of an entrepreneurial mindset for us. So the first one, curiosity, connections, and creating value. It's wonderful to have this behind me. I wish we had one of these. Mindset. Are you stuck with it? Is it your personality, or can you change it? A Stanford psychologist who studies mindset gave children puzzles. She would give them a puzzle, and the child would come in and solve the puzzle. On a second visit, she would give them a choice. You can, use, you can do the same puzzle, or you can do a different puzzle. All right, some would choose the same, some would choose different. She determined some mindset characteristics. But you know the most important part of her work was that mindset can change. It can change in context, it can be changed by education, it can be changed by your own intentions. But if all those are working together, your own intentions to exercise that mindset in a certain way, you, you may need a spotter, that's pretty good, or a coach or a professor. But this is all about exercising and developing a certain way of thinking, a mindset that is that in-between filter. It's back to Ben. Okay, so I was in this uh, workshop, so I asked Ben a question that I had never asked an engineering student before. In fact, instead of a normal reaction to Ben, he had to finish a few classes. I could have just enrolled him in those classes and got him going, but I said something, asked him something different. I said, Ben, forget about electrical engineering. It's like heresy. Forget about electrical engineering. What do you want to do that creates value for other people? Ben got excited. He started talking about hydroponics. There's fish in the bottom of this tank. The fish create waste. That gets pumped up and it, it uh, feeds lettuce. And then that whole ecosystem becomes something that, uh, that I could not figure out how electrical engineering fit into. But because of this workshop, I had other colleagues that were thinking about creating value. So I sent Ben over to the office of a young, energetic chemistry professor. She didn't happen to be there, so he waited outside. He waited outside for half a day. This part of the story is I just have to relate to you because I wasn't there. Ben was sitting down. She's walking back to her office. Ben looks up and says, Dr. Melton sent me. She steps around him <laughs> into her office, closes the door, and calls me. This part I know. <laughs> and she says, is this guy okay? <laughs> and I reply, don't worry about the stocking cap. <laughs> He's got something you want to hear. It happens that she was working with biodigesters. Biodigesters are a mechanism in which you produce methane from sewage waste, field waste, whatever. You produce methane, and methane can be used for energy sources. That's what she was working with. It turns out that Ben's electronic knowledge in terms of data acquisition, signal processing, and controls could be applied. What a match. 
he found out how he could create value. This just furthered his entrepreneurial mindset. A little aside. When I was on campus here, I used to wear this button on my jean jacket. I still have it. I mean, it literally is this button. I know you're thinking this is a desperate cry for help. <laughs> but it turns out there is actually a really good reason to love an engineer. The reason, one reason, is that a Berkeley economist found that an engineer in a metropolitan community creates five additional jobs. They are the highest mul job multiplier that you can add to a community. It's because they create exported tradable goods and they, they need to contribute to the jobs of a baker, a grocer, a doctor, a dentist, a barber. Well, some, some contribute to a barber. <laughs> so love an engineer, even if it's difficult, it helps the neighborhood. Putting engineering together with this entrepreneurial mindset is not exactly a natural thing. But the foundation for which I work has created this opportunity to do that. And so we're working with 28, at this time, 28 different universities, 3,500 engineering faculty members, and we're also including many other faculty members, to educate 50,000 engineering students, and it's growing. And you can see in the middle red dot that WSU, I'm pleased to say, is part of this network. This is a picture of Ben. You want to hear the rest of the story? All right. So because of Ben's work with this, this uh, biodigesters and a Swedish company, turned out, took him to Sweden so he could see this on a large scale see how it works, to even create more value. He came back to his hometown, Flint, Michigan, and built a biodigester with the municipality there, which caught the interest of the king of Sweden, who came to visit and see Ben's project. Are you kidding me? This is news. Google it. <laughs> Weird, crazy stuff happens when you create and deliver value. So what's the takeaway? The takeaway is that everybody in here is a change agent. You can exercise that. This may seem silly to you, but it's the start of an entrepreneurial mindset where you're thinking deeply about the relationship of value and design. Thank you.